Hey everybody, welcome back to General Biochemistry. We're going to finish up our discussion of enzymes, so we are on part two of chapter six. If you did not watch the part one video, you need to stop this right now and go to the part one video. We'll continue our discussion of enzymes, picking up with enzyme kinetics. I showed you this slide in part one, and we talked about steady state. Now we're going to pick up our conversation with pre-steady state, where we're looking at the period where you have the buildup of that enzyme substrate complex, and you can identify the rate limiting step. So pre-steady state kinetics is pretty powerful, and you can look at specific reaction steps, particularly ones that are very, very fast. You can use this to measure the rate constants of individual steps like the chemistry step or some conformational change. And you do this by using a stopped flow device. There's a resource that I posted on here. You can uh, put that link into your web browser and it brings up an article and a video that talks about using the stopped flow if you're really interested. But a stopped flow device allows you to very rapidly mix your enzyme and substrate and quench the reaction, usually with acid. And you can sample really, really quickly so you can see absorbance or fluorescence or whatever signal you need to see. And we're talking about looking at, you know, milliseconds or seconds, very, very small snippets of time. And you're taking a lot of data points in that snippet of time. There is something called kind of the dead time, which is the amount of time that it takes for the, um, for the detection to actually start. So in between the mixing of the substrate and the enzyme and the detection, that's the window of dead time where there's reaction happening, but you're not actually looking at a signal for it, your fluorescence, your absorbance. And really expensive stop flows will have like a super teeny tiny amount of dead time so that you're not missing any details. Oftentimes, for a lot of enzymes, dissociation of the product is rate limiting. So if you have this scenario, instead of going straight from, and I'll write up the two-step scenario we were working with last time, where you had enzyme binding to its substrate and forming that ES complex, and then we just said, okay, that's going to break down to enzyme plus protein. That's our two-step mechanism. In reality, though, most of the time you're going to form this enzyme product complex, and that's actually going to happen pretty quickly. That's where you're doing the chemistry, and you form this enzyme product complex, but releasing the product is slow. So this last step is very slow. So in this scenario, in this mechanism that we have, K3 is rate limiting. We can use pre-steady state kinetics to determine the rate limiting step. So if you see a burst, then that means that you have a rate limiting step. It doesn't tell you which step it is, but it tells you that you have one. So you're rapidly mixing, again, your enzyme and your substrate, and then you're quenching with acid after a short amount of time. You'll notice that for each of these, there's kind of, so with the other, um, with the steady state, we would say, okay, 
we're going to take our tangent from time 0, and that's going to be our initial velocity. But here, the, the time is so short that we shouldn't see any kind of initial velocity and then kind of a tapering off because we're doing a really short time frame. So we should just see some kind of linear increase. If we don't, then that means we have a burst. That's called a burst and we have a rate limiting step that you can determine. And the beauty of this is that you know that this rate limiting step occurs after you've started monitoring product formation. So that means that you may be major product and it hasn't been released yet, or maybe you made your product and it's been released, but your enzyme and substrate require some kind of conformational change that's slow. So these are all things that you can't really determine with michaelis menten or steady state kinetics. Oh, one more note. So another uh, shout out. So this is actually from a paper from my thesis lab. Uh, it's actually, it's in your book. This enzyme is, we're looking at RNASP. And this figure is from a paper from my thesis lab. So yeah, y'all, I'm legit. I went to school. Okay. Very, very side note. Not going to be on the exam, promise. So that's it for talking about analyzing kinetics in terms of just studying, you know, basic enzyme um, chemistry. But another powerful tool that we can use are inhibitors. And this kind of helps you to look at, okay, how can I understand this enzyme a little bit better? If you can build something that inhibits an enzyme, then that means you understand its mechanism. And oftentimes the drugs that we use are inhibitors. So let's talk about how we can um, analyze the kinetics of inhibitors. So in inhibitors are just molecules that interfere with catalysis. And there's two classes that we're going to talk about, reversible and irreversible, which is pretty self-explanatory. There's different types of reversible inhibition. We're really going to focus on the first three. We're not going to worry too much about non-competitive inhibition. So competitive inhibition means that you have an inhibitor that binds the same spot as your substrate would. So if you have an enzyme that binds substrate S, your inhibitor, which is I, is going to bind in the same spot as S. So they are competing for the same spot in the active site. Competitive inhibition is a type of reversible inhibition. So it can bind and be released just like a substrate. You're going to see this alpha prime. We're not going to talk too much about alpha prime and, and, you know, the specific numbers of how a, an inhibitor affects certain parameters, kinetic parameters. But we will talk about the fact that competitive inhibitors affect the apparent KM. So you don't need to know about, again, this alpha in terms of by how much. But just know that competitive inhibitors affect the apparent KM, but they don't do anything to the Vmax. What do we mean by this? The apparent KM is the experimentally determined KM when you have your substrate and your inhibitor present. So if you have substrate present with your inhibitor and you have a really high concentration of your substrate, you can still see normal kinetic behavior. You see the normal Vmax, but you will notice that your KM has increased. That means that you need more substrate than you normally would 
to reach the same velocities. And that makes sense because you have an inhibitor that is competing for that same spot, but you're not doing any chemistry. When you're looking at a line weaver burke plot, which remember that's also called a double reciprocal plot, you can actually see when you have a competitive inhibitor. When you have a competitive inhibitor, 1 over V max, which is your Y intercept, doesn't change. But if you look at the X axis, we no longer have the same negative one over KM value. So your KM has changed. And anytime you see that, you know you're dealing with an inhibitor. The next type of inhibition that we'll cover is uncompetitive inhibition. And that means that you have some molecule that binds at a site that is distinct from the substrate active site. So you can still have your substrate bound to your enzyme and the inhibitor can bind at the same time. And when it does, it inhibits. So a difference between uncompetitive and competitive, in addition to the fact that the binding site for these inhibitors is different, the competitive, excuse me, the uncompetitive inhibitor likes to bind the ES complex. It's still reversible, so if that inhibitor falls off, then you can still have some kind of um, catalysis occur. But that inhibitor will bind the ES complex and it is frozen in time until that inhibitor leaves. Uncompetitive inhibitors affect both the apparent KM and the Vmax. So your Vmax is going to decrease and your apparent KM is going to decrease as well. This is what it looks like on that double reciprocal plot. All of your y-intercepts for the different concentrations of uh, inhibitor are different. So that means your Vmax is different. And we see the same thing with our x-intercept. They're all different for the different concentrations of inhibitors. With mixed inhibition, we're again looking at a site that is distinct from the substrate active site. But it doesn't really mind binding to the enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex. It doesn't care. It'll bind to either one. Usually you'll see an effect on both KM and Vmax. So Vmax is affected because you're affecting the amount of enzyme substrate complex, right? Just like with the uncompetitive inhibition, you're effectively reducing the amount of enzyme substrate complex that can go forward and do chemistry. Your apparent KM may increase or decrease and it really just depends on whether or not your inhibitor binds the free enzyme better or the enzyme substrate complex better. So that one you can't really say for sure, oh, the KM is absolutely going to increase every time or decrease every time. Again, we've got that Lineweaver-Burke plot. 
and we've got a change in both the VMAX and the KM. The lines intersect still, but we're looking at an intersection that's to the left of the y-axis. So there's a they do converge, but not on that y-axis. So those are the irreversible or those are the reversible inhibition types that we're going to talk about. Now we're going to move on to irreversible. Irreversible inhibitors bind covalently or in essence they just destroy the functionality of the enzyme. So they'll bind tightly, covalently, or they form a really stable complex and it's a non-covalent interaction. But it is effectively, you, this enzyme is no longer available that inhibitor is not going to um, release so it's stuck it's dead you can have what's called a suicide inactivator which is also called a mechanism based inactivator and what that means is you have an inhibitor that will undergo a few steps of catalysis you know so It'll go through maybe the first one or two steps to convert A to B, but then it becomes covalently attached, let's say. So in this example, we've got serine 195 of an enzyme. We're going to talk about an enzyme that uses a serine 195 for catalysis coming up. But if you have this enzyme that I'm going to leave nameless for now, and you add in an inhibitor, it can undergo part of the mechanism that it normally would do and then it gets stuck. So that is a mechanism-based inactivator. Transient state analogs are also really great um, irreversible inhibitors because they're designed to resemble the transition state that an enzyme would already be trying to um, achieve with its substrate. So you have this transition state analog that is complementary to the enzyme. Remember, the enzyme is not 100% complementary to its substrate. It's complementary to the transition state. So if you have something that looks like the transition state, it's going to bind really tightly. And you don't have to have a covalent interaction for that enzyme to hold on to it forever. Now we're going to move on to what I think is a really fun part of this chapter, looking at an e examples of enzymatic reactions. We've done all this talk about theoretical stuff. Now we're going to look at some actual enzymes. The first one we're going to talk about is chymotrypsin. We brought up chymotrypsin a little bit here and there, but now we're really going to talk about it. Chymotrypsin is a protease, and that means that it's an enzyme that cleaves peptide bonds, and it uses water to do so. On the right, you can see kind of a topology diagram for, for part A, and then B, C, and D all give some detail about the protein structure. And D in particular is what we're interested in because this shows you the active site. The residues that are in the active site are shown in red in the topology diagram. So all those really key ones are highlighted. You'll also notice some of the structural components here. There's some disulfide bonding going on to stabilize the, the conformation of this protein. Just a side note. Chymotrypsin is a serine protease. So a serine residue in the active site is the nucleophile for the reaction. 
If you remember your organic chemistry, you probably have heard the term nucleophile quite a lot. The nucleophile is the oxygen that's on serine 195. So remember that serine has an OH. And that oxygen is the nucleophile. The active site contains what's called a catalytic triad, and you'll see that in serine proteases. And it's just the, the network of hydrogen bonding that enables serine to be a really good nucleophile. So in this case, we've got a serine, we've got a histidine, and an aspartate. And we need all three of these for activity. There's two phases in this mechanism. The first part is the acylation phase. And that's when the peptide bond is cleaved. So you have a peptide substrate that binds. And you cut that and you form an ester linkage between that peptide carbonyl carbon and your enzyme. So what that means is you've got an enzyme. And remember that serine 195? So you've made an acyl intermediate, okay? You've got part of a peptide that was part of your substrate. It is covalently attached to your enzyme. In the second phase, you have the deacylation phase. And this one uses water to cleave that bond. So that's the second phase. You cleave that bond and you liberate that piece of peptide and you regenerate serine 195. Now just as a little bit of practice, after listening to this description of the mechanism, think about the kind of catalysis that might be. We talked about general acid base catalysis, covalent modification, and we also talked about metal ion catalysis. So think about what kind of catalysis this might be. Now we're going to step through the mechanism. I'm not going to expect you to push the arrows for this particular reaction, but I do want you to understand overall how it works. We're going to get to some arrow pushing more in metabolism. This is the warm up. So this is an active site uh, cartoon for chymotrypsin. We've got all of our players here. There are two other key aspects of this active site. The first is the hydrophobic pocket. This is necessary for binding of the substrate. Chymotrypsin likes to cleave after aromatic residues. And that aromatic residue, the R group, is going to nestle in quite nicely here in this hydrophobic pocket. It's going to hold on to it. The other thing that this active site has is what's called an oxyanion hole. And this is the place that stabilizes the charged transition state. So when we make an intermediate before we cleave the first bond, that's where it's going to be stabilized. So we have a substrate bind. It's got an aromatic group. Aromatic group is nestled into that hydrophobic pocket. We've got the carbonyl of the peptide bond, the amide bond, secured with hydrogen bonding. It's positioned so that 
the serine 195 can act as a nucleophile. So what has to happen for that is this histidine and aspartate, the histidine acts as a general base. and it deprotonates the serine residue. The reason it can do this, which normally serine is not very easy to deprotonate, but because of the closeness of that hydrogen bond with aspartate and the histidine, and it gets kind of squished together when that substrate binds, it actually makes the pKa of histidine high, higher than it normally would be. And because of that, it can deprotonate the serine residue. So we always talk about, you know, biological pH being about seven, but the beauty of enzymes is that within an active site, you can have a change in pH that's very small and very local that enables chemistry to happen much, much more rapidly. That's what we see here. So when the serine is deprotonated, it can then attack this carbonyl carbon of your substrate. And then that double bond there, the oxygen is like, I'll take those electrons. I'm cool with that. And when that happens, you form a short-lived intermediate. It's also called a tetrahedral intermediate. And that negative charge is stabilized by the glycine. And there's also the hydrogen bonding from serine from its backbone. So the backbone of glycine 193 and that backbone from the serine 195, the hydrogens there help to stabilize that charge. So hydrogen bonding for the win. Eventually, this intermediate is going to collapse back down onto itself. And when it does, you're going to liberate part of your peptide. So you push these electrons back down and then you snatch that uh, hydrogen from the histidine. So it acts as a general acid here. and you can liberate that peptide. And what you're left with is the acyl enzyme intermediate. You've got part of your peptide still bound to the enzyme via that serine 195. We need to regenerate this enzyme. Otherwise, it'll be consumed just like any other substrate or any other reactant in a chemical reaction. And enzymes are catalysts, so they should not be consumed. This is the deacylation part of this reaction. So we're starting with our acylated protein. Then in comes water which we talk about it like water just, you know, walks right in like, hey guys, you ready for me yet? But the truth is there's water all around in all of the little nooks and crannies that the, um, the cell contents has access to, there's water. So water has already been there. It's just been hanging out, you know, sitting on the bench. And now the coach has said, all right, time out. Water, you're going in. And this time, the histidine is going to deprotonate water. So it's going to act as a general base, again, snatch that proton from the water and make it into a much better nucleophile because it's a hydroxyl group. And that hydroxyl group is going to attack the carbonyl carbon that is still a part of that peptide 
that is attached to serine 195. We're going to form another tetrahedral intermediate and all the things again. And then that intermediate is going to be stabilized once again by that oxyanion hole. So it's literally the same reaction, only this time with water. And when that, inter that intermediate falls apart, you're going to have another peptide piece. And this is your second product. So that collapse happens exactly the same way. And you now have regenerated your enzyme. So remember our free state of enzyme. We've got that hydro, um, hydrophobic pocket and the oxyanion hole. And we're ready for catalysis again. How did people figure out how chymotrypsin works? Well, one way was that they use pre-steady state kinetics. You look at pre-steady state to see if there's some kind of burst that would indicate there's a rate limiting step that happened after product formation. They used something that was not a peptide. Turns out that like most enzymes, chymotrypsin can actually cleave other esters and, um, you know, other small molecules. So it can cleave other amides too. But the advantage that peptides have, or at least longer proteins, poly polypeptides, even long peptides, have over these small molecules is binding. So the binding energy from a peptide or a long polypeptide binding versus a small molecule, that binding energy makes it much more stable and it makes the, the chemistry happen much faster. The reaction rate is faster. With these small molecules, it's actually slower. So it made it a little bit easier for them to study this with pre-steady state because they had more time to look at pre-steady state. It lengthened the amount of time that pre-steady state could actually be studied. And they saw a burst. They did more experiments to determine that, oh, okay, this, what this means is the first reaction is fast where we have the acyl intermediate being formed with the enzyme, but the cleavage of the uh, acylated protein slow. Another tool that as enzymologists have is looking at pH dependence. And we talked about how enzymes are dependent on pH. Depending on where they are, their pH, their optimal pH is going to be likely around seven, but there are exceptions. So doing a pH profile, which is what this is also called, of chymotrypsin, you can get an idea of the protonation state of the different residues involved in catalysis. So you can look at the activity across, you know, a wide range of pHs. And what that really means is that you're looking at... Um, you're doing the same kind of kinetic studies. So you can do steady state kinetics and determine Kcat. You can determine Km. You can ter determine Vmax. All of those things. And then you can do it for all the different pHs that you care about. So maybe you start at pH 5 or 6 and you work your way up to 9 or 10. So you want a good, a good range. And what they discovered is that the optimal activity occurs at around pH 8 where the histidine is unprotonated. And that's important because the histidine needs to be unprotonated to act as a general base for serine. 
if you have protonation of histidine 57, then you're going to have a much less effective enzyme. So proteases are really important. And I'm sure that through all of your biology classes that you've had to take, that you've heard something about HIV. HIV is a retrovirus, which means that it has an RNA genome, and there's an enzyme that's called reverse transcriptase that uses that RNA to make complementary DNA. Once you have that viral genome and you start to translate protein, Sometimes they'll translate a really big polyprotein. So it's just several proteins all on one long polypeptide strand. And the protease, HIV protease in this case, will cut in certain spaces to produce individual proteins. HIV protease is an aspartyl protease, which means that it uses an aspartate residue for its active site nucleophile. It does not form a covalent enzyme substrate intermediate. I'll show you how it works. What it does instead is it directly uh, deprotonates water that's in the active site and that water acts as a nucleophile just like the second half of the reaction for chymotrypsin. So that intermediate forms, and then when it's, you know, says, oh, I'm, I'm too unstable, I'm going to collapse, you form two peptide products. So why do we care about that? Well, obviously, treatments for HIV, a little bit scarce, okay? And one of the ways that HIV is treated is actually with protease inhibitors. And these protease inhibitors form a non-covalent complex with the enzyme. They were designed to mimic the transition state analog. Remember, we talked about these. So think about um, what that might look like in terms of kinetics. So this is an irreversible inhibitor. Think about what that might look like in terms of affecting KM and VMAX. So that's some practice for you as well. And you don't need to memorize any of these structures. You just need to understand the concepts. So we're applying all the concepts that we've learned. We're talking about the different types of catalysis. We're talking about um, general acid-base catalysis in terms of how that's working specifically with these proteases. We're talking about inhibition. So recognizing, oh, this is a transition state analog, so your brain should automatically go to, that's an irreversible inhibitor, and it likely, likely forms very tight non-covalent interactions. So that's the kind of thing that you should be doing with these um, enzyme examples. So we're going to go through another example. Antibiotics. Everybody knows about antibiotics, right? Well, the reason why they work is because bacterial cell walls have peptidoglycans. And it's just a combination of protein and sugars that are cross-linked. And that cross-linking requires an enzyme called transpeptidase. Penicillin, powerful antibiotic, unfortunately, there's some resistance to it. The reason is these beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin can actually be cleaved. Okay, But let's talk about how they work first. So you've got this beta-lactam, which is penicillin, amoxicillin. They covalently and irreversibly modify beta-lactamase. It's essentially, it's a substrate mimic. And what happens is you've got a serine that is covalently modified. It says, hey, look, 
I am an amid bond, just like you're looking for. And then when the serine attacks that carbonyl carbon, there is a bond broken. That amid bond is broken, but there's this carbon-carbon bond here, right? So it was it was part of a ring. So that transpeptidase got tricked. And now it is a stable enzyme that can't do anything because it's got something covalently bound to it. So beta-lactamases are enzymes that can cleave these beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin. And bacteria that express this enzyme, or these enzymes, there's a whole class of them, they're resistant to these types of antibiotics. So what happens is beta-lactamase can actually use water to hydrolyze this bond here. And the water is going to replace the serine. However, you can also have a compound that can inhibit beta-lactamases. And what you need here is you need something that is resistant to hydrolysis. So to break down this figure a little bit better, because they kind of look the same if you don't know exactly what you're looking at. On the left hand side, We've got how beta-lactamases um, cleave antibiotics. And the key here is the hydrolysis. On the right-hand side, we've got inhibitors for beta-lactamases. They are resistant to hydrolysis because once you have that serine attack the carbonyl carbon, you form this double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen, which when it is protonated, you form a carbon-carbon double bond, which another nucleophile within beta-lactamase is happy to attack. And now you've still got this, you've got this um, enzyme that is covalently bonded to an inhibitor. So it's still the same idea, right? We've got an irreversible inhibitor. It's just the chemistry is a bit different so that you can't have the hydrolysis of that bond. Last part of chapter six, regulatory enzymes. Again, I'm probably gonna say this for most things. I mean. I was an enzymologist as a graduate student, and that's my, those are my roots, so I can't, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. So regulatory enzymes, we're talking about catalytic activity being modulated in response to a signal. So it can be increased or decreased. And this is key because your cells have different and changing needs. If your cells are growing, versus if they're dormant, if you're responding to stress. All of these things affect the needs of the cell, which means that the enzymes necessary to do those processes have to be modulated. And sometimes the modulation needs to be rather subtle. We're gonna do a throwback and look at 
some more terms. So allosteric enzymes, allosteric modulators, and effectors, which we're not really going to get too bogged down by semantics between modulators and effectors. They're functionally the same in terms of being things that affect um, the enzyme's ability to function. So they either increase or decrease um, catalysis. We've got reversible binding, um, sorry, reversible covalent modifications, binding of separate regulatory proteins. And we've also got proteolytic cleavage. So you can remove certain peptide segments from an enzyme. So these are all different ways that you can regulate enzymes. With allosteric enzymes, we're talking about some kind of a modulator binding and it's causing a change in the catalytic activity of the enzyme. We can have homotrophic regulators and that's where the substrate and the modulator are identical. So you have one, you know, one molecule bind and it says, hey, you know, we should be more active. And then the active site is, you know, there's some kind of conformational change that makes the active site more available. And then you have increased catalysis. You can also have heterotropic where the modulator is different from the substrate. And that's what we're looking at in this figure on the right. You have a catalytic domain and a regulatory domain. You have a modulator bind that regulatory domain. And in this case, we're calling it a positive modulator because it causes the enzyme to be more active. So you have substrate binding and catalysis, great day. You could also do a little thought experiment about what it would be like if you had a negative modulator. I'll leave that for you to do. So think that through, what it would be like if you have a negative modulator binding to a regulatory domain, how would that affect catalysis? Some enzymes are regulated by reversible covalent modification. Really, really, really big, especially when you're looking at metabolism. Phosphorylation is like, it is rampant. It is everywhere and it controls all the things. There's hierarchy in phosphorylation. If this is phosphorylated, then it can't phosphorylate that, which can't phosphorylate that. Or this is phosphorylated, so it's gonna go and phosphorylate something else and then that's gonna phosphorylate something else. Cascades, they are all over the place. There's adenylation, acetylation, meristylation, all of these ations, lots of different um, modifications that you can do to change the structure of the, of the enzyme or to localize it to a different place so that it can't you know, be in the same place as its substrate or maybe it brings it to its substrate. So there's all different ways that enzymes can be regulated by covalent modification. You don't need to memorize these specifically, but just understand that they can be used to regulate enzymes. We'll talk about specific examples when we get to metabolism. So we'll talk a little bit more about phosphorylation. There are two groups of enzymes protein kinases, which are the ones that actually phosphorylate something. So they add the phosphor group to specific amino acid residues. And then there's the phosphoprotein phosphatases, which you'll also just see called phosphatases. And they will cleave off that phosphor group from the same target protein. So you can see these two competing pools of enzymes in cells, you know, regulating the activity of all these different mechanisms. One example would be muscle glycogen phosphorylase activity. We're going to talk about how glycogen um, is regulated in tissues. 
and we're definitely going to talk extensively about glycogen phosphorylase. But for now, we'll just use it as a little example. When it is not phosphorylase, or excuse me, when it's not phosphorylated, it's in the phosphorylase B formation, okay? When this enzyme gets phosphorylated, it is much more active. And that's called the phosphorylase A form. When it's active, then that means that you're going to be doing some chemistry. So you're going to be chopping up some of that glycogen. This is what it looks like when you're looking at glycogen phosphorylase in the structure. The T state and the R state, if you remember when we were talking about hemoglobin, R state is the ready state. So that means that this one is more active. And the difference is when you look at the site where the phosphorylation occurs, I just kind of circle the patch here that we're interested in. Notice that the amino terminus, so that's the N terminus, it's hanging out down here in pink. When you have phosphorylation occur, then there's some changes to the structure here that enable this uh, N terminus to interact with a series of arginine residues and it changes the architecture in such a way that enables the enzyme to be more active. So it's just another way of showing structure and function are very tightly related and that these small changes to the R groups, we're adding a, a, a couple of phosphate groups can cause a big difference in the structure and function of an enzyme. Usually you'll see some kind of a common structural motif or a, census, a consensus sequence where proteins typically are phosphorylated and of course dephosphorylated, having that phosphor group removed. This is just a table of some of the consensus sequences for different protein kinases. You don't need to know this, but just recognize that this exists. There are consensus sequences and it shows you which residue or residues are phosphorylated. Oftentimes you need more than just one phosphorylation event. It's usually two or three that will dictate change. And that's so that there can be a more subtle change in um, enzymatic activity. So you have some range. So you can have sequential phosphorylation or sequential dephosphorylation and that again correlates to you know a slow increase or a slow decrease in enzyme activity. So we need to have that flexibility because we've got such a wide range of physiological things that can happen that you need to respond to. Some enzymes are regulated by cleavage. So if you have an enzyme that has to be cleaved first before it is active, the inactive precursor is called a zymogen. Chymotrypsin is actually an example of something that's a zymogen. So it's inactive until it gets cleaved and then it's ready to roll and start cleaving other proteins. Trypsin is another protease that also exists as, as a zymogen, and it needs to have its N terminus clipped before it's active. We can have the same thing with proteins. It's just called a proprotein or a proenzyme. Okay. Insulin is actually like a proprotein. It needs to be cleaved first before it's actually active. That's just one little example. Oftentimes, regulatory cascades are, um, they have a whole host of 
regulation in terms of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation or the activation of zymogens leading to some kind of response. So we're going to look at activation of zymogens and blood coagulation, aka forming blood clots. So a blood clot is just an aggregate of platelets, and those platelets are cross-linked and stabilized by fibers. And those fibers exist as a, as a zymogen. Thromboxanes stimulate coagulation. And so once you have that signal, then this whole cascade starts. You have to cleave fibrinogen to form fibrin, which is the active protein that can actually form those fibers. And again, you don't need to know all the specifics of this example, but be familiar with it so that if I say something about it or I give you a more detailed scenario on an assignment or an exam, that you have an understanding generally of how it works so that we can talk about what happens when you try to break it. Okay. So thrombin is a serine protease that catalyzes peptide removal. So it can cleave things. And then there's also a transglutaminase. And I told you that there's some cross-linking that happens to make those fibers. That's what the transglutaminase does. It forms those covalent cross-links. So there's the intrinsic pathway that involves all the components that are in blood plasma. And then there's the extrinsic pathway where there's tissue factors that are found that are not found in the blood. And both of these pathways lead to activation of fibrinogen, which then leads to forming those blood clots. Some regulatory enzymes use a bunch of different regulatory mechanisms. We'll see that a lot in metabolism because you need to be able to respond to lots of different signals. So when resources are plentiful, you're synthesizing things, you're storing glucose, you're storing up because all, all is well. When they're scarce, then your cell is going to say, hey, whoa, stop storing we need to start pulling some of our stores out so that we can fuel metabolism and keep this body going. So the availability of different catalysts allows for that regulation. So you may have something that's regulated by metal ions fluctuating, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, localization. So maybe you put a lipid on there so that something can be localized to a membrane all kinds of regulation come together to coordinate the movement of all of these cellular activities. So with that, thanks for watching. That's the end of chapter six. Hopefully you've got some good solid examples of how enzymes work and how you can use kinetics to study enzymes and understand the regulatory mechanisms. Be safe and I'll see you in class.